Trading Global Markets Decoded with Daily FX is brought to you by IEG, the world leading online trading and investments provider. Welcome. You're listening to the Trading Global Markets Decoded podcast with Daily FX. I'm your host, analyst and editor at Daily FX, Martin Essex. We bring you trading insights on the world's biggest market, the $5 trillion a day FX market, as well as commodities and other key assets while describing the opportunities that may be emerging around the world. Good morning, everybody. Good afternoon. Good evening, depending upon where you are in the world. And welcome to this podcast. With me today is Lauren Simmons. Three years ago, at the age of 22, she became the youngest full-time female trader at the New York Stock Exchange and only the second African-American woman in the exchange's history to have such a position. Lauren has now moved on, becoming a keynote speaker, author and general financial guru. Lauren, welcome. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Uh, Lauren, I know you've left the exchange now, but I'd like to start by asking you about your experiences there before moving on to what you're doing now. So first, why did you decide to become a full-time trader? You know, it's very interesting. When you graduate from college, you have all these big plans of what you think you're going to do. I majored in genetics, um, studying in college, and I realized writing my senior thesis that It wasn't something that I wanted to pursue because it wasn't as technologically advanced as I had hoped. Uh, But one thing that I did know is I wanted to move to New York and December 13th, 2016, two hours after I graduated, I hopped on a plane (laughs) and I moved to New York. Uh, From there, I really relayed, relied heavily on my statistics minor. Um, I went to school for genetics, had a background in statistics, and I also studied architectural engineering. Um, so I had a lot of a very full length background in statistics. And when I was applying for jobs, and it wasn't necessarily the New York Stock Exchange that I was specifically applying for, I spoke, you know, about statistics and was able to uh, be offered a position at the New York Stock Exchange. That sounds like quite a resume, genetics as well as statistics. Wow. Why did you choose the stock market in particular rather than, say, you know, trade currencies or commodities or bonds? You know, I didn't. I, again, spoke with uh, through networking, through a lot of networking from LinkedIn. I met a guy who worked for a very large financial institution. I won't name which one, but He said, you know, would you be open to an equity trading position at the New York Stock Exchange? And for me, it was a no brainer. I didn't go to the floor thinking that I was going to be a trader. I was very um, vocal about becoming a financial analyst because of my statistics background. Um, But I was excited to take on the opportunity. So the opportunity was definitely given to me. And I took the risk of, you know, putting myself in a position that I knew nothing about um, and going from there. And were you actually trading on the exchange floor? I was. um, It was exciting. It was scary. It was um, just such a mix of emotions. Um, So as an equity trader, you have to make uh, decisions in microseconds. And trading is definitely a job where you can't hide behind anyone else if you make a mistake. You have to be accountable for your mistake, explain the reason why you decided to make that decision. And so, um, you know, of course, you know, Richard Rosenblatt, the one that hired me of Rosenblatt Securities, you know, my first two years on the board, you, you know, said I would never put you in a position where you would, you know, deliberately make a massive error that we couldn't recover. <laughs> um, so no pressure. But of course, the first day that I was actually trading, you know, it's a lot of money and you want to be great. And in any ways, it, it was it was a very exhilarating position. I did ultimately throughout my time on the floor did make a two million dollar error, which I thought was Oops. a lot. Um, yeah. It turned out not to be. Um, we we came in the next morning, figured everything out, and it only ended up being a three thousand dollar error. But um, that must have been know, a scary like, yeah. night for you. Yeah, it was. I mean, and but that that's another like skill set that you learn being on the trading floor. You 
cannot um, dwell or think of, you know, worst case scenarios when you're off the floor. I know that the news can, you know, be a lot. So I had to turn off the news. I had to not read anything about the stock market and kind of just go about my everyday until I was back on the trading floor and had to rectify the situation. So what, how how does that work? How do, what, what goes through your head when you're deciding whether to buy or sell or leave well alone? How do you make these decisions? Well, you know, we trade on behalf of clients. And so our institutional clients pretty much give us a lot of direction of what, you know, what they want to buy and sell. And and typically at what, at what price? I mean, I was a junior trader, so it wasn't like I was making decisions off the cuff of, you need to buy this stock. It was always, you know, with their guidance of which stocks they wanted to buy or sell and typically at which price. So um, the more sophisticated you get, you do get a little more leeway at um, buying certain stocks for your clients. But again, anything that you do, you have to go through them first to make sure that they're comfortable with that decision. Now, the photographs that I've seen of the New York Stock Exchange floor seems to be mostly slightly older white men. Did you feel out of place there or is, is this just not a fair uh, picture of what it's like there? No, it's a pretty accurate. I mean, I was the only female trader and I think at the time there was 250 men and of the 250 men, there were seven people under the age of 30 that worked on the floor um and me being the youngest so 22 through 30 there were seven of us so um that's a very accurate de depiction i i believe you know trading has evolved it has changed and so a lot of the men that are over the age of 30 that have been on the floor will continue to stay on the floor uh for the rest of their career anybody under the age of 30 typically only stays on the trading floor for two and a half years. And then they go on and they decide that they love finance and they go and do something else within the financial industry or that, you know, this isn't something that they want to do and they change career paths entirely. That's not a great demography for 2020, is it? <laughs> uh, would you, would you recommend becoming a professional trader to other young women? Um, I wouldn't even, I, I, excluding women, I would say like overall, I wouldn't recommend trading. Um, trading, again, we, the New York Stock Exchange used to have thousands and thousands of employees on the floor and now there's only 250. And even, you know, outside of the exchange floor, trading desk overall, um, you know, used to have full floors full of traders and now they only have maybe 10 or so traders um, in, in a department. And so even the men on the floor that were leaving the ones under the age of 30, it was hard to try to find another, um, equity trading position outside of the trading floor, because it's a job that has definitely, uh, dissolved. And that is through technology. And even with the exchange floor being closed for the past two and a half months, they opened up recently people realize that, yes, you you can use algos to trade and you don't necessarily need a human trader to do so. I'll come back to that in a moment, if I may. But let's say someone mm -hmm. really wants to become a professional trader. How should they go about it? Networking is going to be your best friend. Um, and, you know, reaching out to people who can get you a position within that space I wouldn't necessarily say that you need to have a background in trading. I, I definitely didn't have a background in trading. And if you interviewed a lot of the men on the trading floor, they had um, wide ranges of degrees. Um, one guy was in woodcutting, one guy was in journalism, art history. So, um, and you know what, but that's not uncommon, right? Because people in their lifetime will change their careers anywhere between two to three times. Um, but if it is a passion, you know, definitely be able to reach out to people, but realize that like, for instance, for me on the trading floor, I only made $23,000, 23 us American thousand dollars. So that wasn't a lot of money and that wasn't enticing enough for me to say, one, I'm passionate about this Two, I want to stay for this little mm -hmm. bit of money. Um, 
And that was barely enough money to breathe in New York City. So, you know, anybody that wants to do it, make sure that you want to do it because you're actually passionate about it and don't get, um, you know, excited about the, the compensation that you could potentially have. I know people have this belief that if you work in the financial industry, you're going to have these lucrative salaries. And that's not necessarily the case. Well, that's exactly what I was going to say to you. I mean, you know, we, we have this film image, don't we, of extremely rich people doing all sorts of strange things. But uh -huh. not not if you're a floor trader. Do, do, do you actually not need any professional qualifications at all? Um, no, I mean, obviously, you have to get licensed. Like I had to take the once you're on the trading floor, the job wasn't fully mine. I had to take the Series 19 which um, has an 80% bell rate. And the story behind the Series 19, prior to me coming to the floor, the exchange floor used to be private. And that's when they used to have these very um, handsome paychecks and getting paid mm -hmm. seven figures. Once the exchange moved over to being public and, it, and the test was administered under FINRA, which prior to FINRA, the way that you passed an exam you can, you know, give your administrator a 12 pack of beer or you were allowed to <laughs> um, grade your own exam. Um, but once it actually was a test that was legitimized under FINRA, you actually had to pass. And so why there's such a high fail rate is because if you ask the other men on the trading floor, as I did, trying to figure out how to pass this exam, they didn't have the answers <laughs> because they <laughs> didn't take the exam. Um, essentially. So it was it was hard and it wasn't anything that I could Google. But as far as having professional qualifications, you get licensed um, as you and, you know, get into the financial industry, not even as an equity trader. If you want to get the Series 7, that's not something that you have prior to getting the job. Um, that's something that you get afterwards. And it's not even called the Series 7 anymore. It's called the SIE. And you have to be sponsored by a company to be able to uh, get licensed. So what skills does a trader need, not just a professional trader, but somebody who's trading from home as well? What are the, what are the most important skills, do you think, to be a successful trader? Um, definitely, again, making decisions in microseconds and being OK with whatever decision that you make. Um, so that's going to have a bit of you know perseverance and confidence. Um, if you're being a professional trader, then there's going to be a social component to it, right, because you want to build up clients. Um, but if you are, you know, a trader at home, I would definitely say, you know, understanding the market, of course, um, and that is going to be putting in a lot of hours and understanding the history of, of the, you know, the stock market um, and, you know, learning how to best navigate um, within your trades. I think, you know, with the crash that we had back in March, really shows at least towards millennials and Gen Z or traders how much they capitalize on the drop in the market back in March. There were so many investors, especially older investors that have been trading in the stock market for a very long time saying, don't trade in airline stocks, don't trade and travel. Um, it's just not going to be good. And now we're seeing, you know, months later now in June, that airline and travel has gone up. That isn't to say that you should trade in those stocks because I'm very much far away from them, but you don't have to do what the normal is because it could be in your favor for sure. Now, something else I want to pick up on what you just said um, about socializing. Um, it gives me pictures of you know going drinking in the evenings and so on. I sort of thought that went away in the 1980s. Is it still important? Yeah. Um, yes, to wine and dine your client for sure. I was, you know, I, again, trading wasn't a passion and I knew this, but I took my job serious and I was always, I woke up at 430 every single day to be on the trading floor at 530. I was one of the first people on the trading floor every single morning and I was one of the last people to leave the trading floor. And if we had to go out with clients, I was out till two o'clock in the morning to be awake at 4.30 in the morning. So that definitely is very much still the culture down there. Um, <laughs> and it, it is very important, but not even just in trading, just you know, building up your client book within the financial industry as well. Mm, I'm surprised. Let me pick you up then on what you were saying earlier. You said uh, 
is floor trading now essentially redundant because of algo trading? I think everything has this purpose. I won't say redundant, but I do believe that with the market being closed for two and a half months, we could really see um, that we did not need human traders. And it should also be noted that um, the New York Stock Exchange is the only exchange floor that still has human traders. So that definitely gives you insight into how this position has evolved over time. Yeah, because the big Chicago markets have, have all stopped floor trading as well, haven't they? Yep. Can a human being ever beat a machine? Um, can a human trader ever beat a machine? When we're giving advice to people <laughs> who come to us, for example, um, one of the key things to say is, if there's an important data release, like, say, US non-farm payrolls data, don't try and trade around that figure because there's always going to be a machine that's always going to beat you when the results come out. So it, it's it, you're almost on a hiding to nothing trying to beat those computer programs that will be buying or selling immediately after the figure much faster than you can press a button. It seems to me that that is entirely logical, but there must be other situations don't you think where perhaps people think differently from those machines and therefore can there are still opportunities for people in the markets or am i wrong with that i think from the standpoint of being outside the exchange floor i think you're you're correct i think being on the exchange floor one of the reasons why we still why there are human traders still on the floor is because we have access to the market makers we have access to the people that you know, set that um, opening stock market price and they know before the algos and the machines know. And so we're able to uh, directly communicate with them and we have a better position when it comes to trading because we have that direct communication. Now, if it ever came a time where DMM specialists weren't on the floor and currently at the moment they're not, they are still off the floor because the exchange floor still now only has 25% of people back on the floor. Um, yeah, I, I believe that, that you know, you a, a, a machine could absolutely do what, what we are doing. But nonetheless, I suspect an amateur trading from home can still be successful. In fact, I know they can, even if I suppose it's true to say that most amateur traders lose money, but nonetheless, it is possible to to be a personal trader and be successful, isn't it? It is for sure. I mean, if it definitely, if it's a passion of yours, I would you know encourage you to do it. For me, me personally, trading from home, I guess I, I'm I'm involved in stocks, but it's not something that I make it a nine to five job or you know constantly checking the news of you know how such and such stock is doing. Um, but it is something that you like, I keep using the word passion, but it is something that you have to be absolutely passionate about and okay with losing money. But I think, you know, for most people getting wrapped up in that kind of lifestyle mindset can be a lot and, um, can definitely discourage you from wanting to continue, continue pursuing day trading. Now, if I can be personal for a moment, you've been called the wolf et of Wall Street. You've been profiled by Forbes. I've even read that a film's being made about you. How have you managed to cope with all that attention? At this point, I won't say it's normal, but this is going on about two years of this kind of lifestyle. Um, but it's exciting. I mean, since leaving the trading floor, I'm, you know, an executive producer for film and TV, producing my own biopics starring Kiersey Clemens that I can't wait for everybody to see um, come next year. Um, and, you know, creating, a, you know, my own TV show, personal finance TV show, which is really exciting. Um, but I'm so grateful and fortunate to be able to use my platform to be able to share my message. And especially in, you know, in today's time, I did become the second African-American female trader and the exchange is 225 years. And while that's great for me on a personal level, just being able to accomplish that, on the flip side, it is bittersweet that we are still making achievements in 2000, anything based off of um, 
gender or skin color or etc like I think people should just be great within their position um so yeah to be noticed and recognized is great and and hopefully um inspiring to other young women or people who are others in the room to go on and be fearless and you know to make their own history um but it, it is definitely something that I, I take and I and I try to be really good at, at what I do and use my voice for for good. With me today is Lauren Simmons, who was the youngest full time female trader at the New York Stock Exchange and only the second African-American woman in the exchange's history to have such a position. We'll be back in a few moments after this break. Trade with Daily FX parent company IG for more than 80 FX pairs. Visit IG.com and start your trading journey today. I've seen, Lauren, so many pictures of you online. Um, you've been um, uh, doing photo shoots and so on. How, do, how does that fit in? How did you manage to have time to do those too? Uh, yeah, so I've become brand ambassadors for Ford, AT&T, and Visalign. Um, Again, they really are invested in my story and they want to be able to highlight and use it as a platform to be able to inspire others. And I love that big corporations and brands want to get behind me and, and you know, try to diversify and, and get more people that look like me or others, you know, within those spaces as well. So I, you know, think it's great. My schedule is busy. Um, I do travel a lot and, you know, but nothing, nothing to complain about. I'm definitely very grateful to be able to have multiple hats and to be able to do this and really enjoy what I'm passionate, like really enjoy what I'm doing. Like I love what I do. So tell me more about this film that you're producing and directing. Yeah. So it's a biopic on my life story. It's going to be predominantly my time on the trading floor it is going to be financed by AGC Studios, and it'll be starring Kiersey Clemens, who is a phenomenal actress. The script is wonderful. Like, I'm so happy to uh, be a part of this, you know, this entire process, as well as the cast. I can't wait to share more details with everyone. Um, but the pandemic hit, and uh, while this movie was supposed to be released this summer, um, it is now being pushed back to 2021. Uh, but nonetheless, I'm still very excited um, to be on this project. And because of this project, I was able to then create my own TV show, which is also um, we're partnering with AG AGC Studios. Um, and I can't wait for everybody to see that as well. So what's that uh, about? What's the TV show about? So the TV show is a personal finance show, and we're going into – the lives of millennials and Gen Zers who are very much spending above their means. They are living the social media lifestyle, but they really can't afford the social media lifestyle. And so we're really breaking down the basics of understanding their finances and getting them on track to, you know, spend within their means. So it's going to be very exciting. So you're doing effectively personal finance advice for millennials and gen zers is that right yep yep wow and you're also an author and a motivational speaker yes so i also have a book coming out um again the <laughs> pandemic has pushed everything back how do you uh, fit all this in it's extraordinary <laughs> thank you I, I have no idea but um <laughs> yes my my book is a personal finance book as well but also a um, um, a mental book in the sense of, you know, your mind is what creates the barriers to your reality. And if you want to make something happen, it starts at your mind. And so I'm really excited to be doing that, as well as motivational speaking uh, that I've been doing since a little bit before. I love the trading floor. Um, and I've got to travel amazing places, Berlin, Beijing, Ireland, um, and be in spaces. When, when I flew out to Beijing, I was in a room with 500 executive um, men, and I was the only woman in the room. And while, yes, I was the only woman in the room when I was on the trading floor, it's a very much different experience to be in that type of environment where they don't typically um 
lean in towards women. And so to be able to, to be on that stage and to deliver that message and for them to actually consider what I'm saying, especially as a woman of color um, who's American, uh, was was just an extraordinary experience. So yeah, that's a little bit of what I do. And it's it's a, it's an amazing, amazing time. How do you motivate people if you're in a country like uh, Germany or uh, China? How do you, how do you get to motivate these people? Uh, I get to motivate them by again, it, it's mindset, everything. I, I don't want to try to highlight too much on like skin color and sex and all that fun stuff. It really is about wanting to just have really good talent and wanting to just do more better culturally for your company. And everybody knows that that inherently means, you know, better revenue for a company. And so if you're really just looking at the basic foundations of how to increase your revenue, just simply by diversifying, then you can really understand um, how to better your company. And so I, especially big talking to big corporations, try to really instill in that, you know, the benefits of doing so and the profitability they will get out of it. How does that go down when you say to people, you need more women and you need more people of color? What do they say? You know, I think a lot of people know the benefits, but they don't like you, you know how to solve a math problem or, you know, an answer to a math problem, but you're like, should I really there's different ways of solving a math problem, like one plus one equals or one plus two equals three, or you could, or so on and so forth. That was a really bad analogy, but (laughs) um, there's different ways to solve a math problem. And so there's different ways of being able to have profitability in a company. And I think if you really understand the value add that someone brings into a company that is an other, then you are you know, light years ahead. And I think people need to realize that, yes, there is strength in, you know, having people that look like you around you, but there is so much more that you can bring into a company by having someone else in that space as well. And once they realize that, and especially when it comes down to the dollar amounts, they realize, okay, yes, we, we need to be doing that. And, and I think um, there are definitely certain companies that do that, but we still have uh, a long way to go. For sure. I hesitate to ask you this, but are there any other exciting projects you'd like to tell us about that are on the way? That is it for the moment. Um, But (laughs) I I can't wait to, you know, share with everyone else updates of what I'm doing. So what do you what do you do if you have any free time? You're away from finance. You're away from all these things. What do you do when you're not working? When I'm not working. Well, I am currently back in Georgia. I was riding out the pandemic in Georgia because I just did not want to be in New York and everybody had left New York as well. Uh, So to be able to be back home and to be able to hike on a daily basis and to go running and the air smells so clean is uh, just a wonderful thing. I think um, self-care is just very important. So I try to take Every day in my routine, whether it's meditating, uh, running, hiking, working out, something that involves self-care because, you know, while my life on the trading floor was stressful, I think it's definitely become even more stressful outside of the trading floor. And I try to implement at least two hours a day to, to just have, you know, time for Lauren. That sounds like there's no time to sleep then. <laughs> there's time to sleep. Yes, yes. Lauren Simmons, thank you very much for joining me today. It's been lovely to talk to you. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Thank you for listening to the Trading Global Markets Decoded with Daily FX podcast. This podcast is brought to you by IG. Check us out at dailyfx.com. If you love the Trading Global Markets Decoded with Daily FX podcast, we'd love for you to subscribe rate and give us a review on iTunes. We'll see you next time.